So what I want to do now is I want to go through an example of a flaculator, design of a flaculator. <clears throat> so I'm going to switch, uh, attempt to do this. I'm going to switch to a Word file and stop the share there. I'm testing all of my abilities. Okay, I think we're good now. Um, yeah. okay. So what we have is we have a cross flow horizontal shaft paddle wheel flaculator. So what that means is, think about it this way. We have cross flow, we have a center shaft here. And on that center shaft, we have a paddle wheel. Okay. And if we looked at the paddle wheel this way, what we really have is, well, let's just, we have this. Okay. So we have four arms in this case of the paddle wheel. These are the arms. And on the arms, we have blades. Okay. And if we, the blades look, so we'd have blades like this. So these would be the blades on the paddle wheel. Okay. So it's cross flow because it's the water is flowing ac across. You can see it this way. Okay. We could arrange it the other way, but we're going to do it with a cross flow. Now we have a total flow rate. So this is our design flow rate. We need to provide redundancy. What we will do, okay, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm dividing the flow into two basins. However, so we have two basins and I'm dividing the flow. The GLIM standards requires that I have to be able to produce water with one treatment train out of service or one unit out of service. So in that case, really what I need is I need a third basin. Okay. So that, for instance, if this basin is out for maintenance, I can still use these two basins and I still can meet this design flow. The detention time that I'll use is 45 minutes. That comes from my jar test. And my G times time, so this is the G value times the detention time, should be between 50,000 to 100,000. And this is based on the 10 state standards for low turbidity where we're, what we want is color removal. So we want, if we had a different water characteristics, we would have to change G. So for instance, if we had high, highly turbid water, we would have to increase G according to the, re the requirements of the 10 state standards. If you're operating in the Midwest, uh, if you're operating elsewhere, there are other standards, or you may, the, as I mentioned, the state or countries may actually adopt the 10 state standard. These values here, 
are all obtained from the draw test. So the draw test was done. Okay. And that's how <clears throat> we obtained or determined tapered flocculation. Now, often what we have is we have multiple compartments in a series. So we would have another compartment here. So for instance, okay. so this would be a second compartment. And the reason we do that is as we're forming, as we're forming this flock, it's getting larger. And as it gets larger, if we maintain a high G value, the flock tends to break apart. So if the flock breaks apart, so if we end up with smaller flock particles and the flock breaks apart, so we have too high G and the flock breaks apart, what happens then to settling? It decreases, exactly. So you see a decrease in efficiency. Then you, <clears throat> and as just was asked, if the flock is breaking apart, the G is too high. So what we do in order to try and minimize the flock um, breaking apart like this, then what we'll do is we decrease, we use what's referred to as tapered flocculation, where we decrease the G value from one compartment to the other. So this is actually a baffle here that allows, so the flow is allowed to move through here. But, it's la but it moves through slowly. Um, it could be a perforated wall with holes in it. Um, it could be a wall with slits at the bottom, typically at the bottom, um, that allows flow through, but at a slower rate. Um, it could just be a slotted wall, um, essentially a slotted wall that allows flow through. So you've got flow through here. In this case, we would have a G value of 50 inverse seconds here. And then in the second compartment, we would have 20 inverse seconds. And then we'd have a third compartment here. And I'm just gonna erase this. I'm not gonna erase it. Um, we'd have a third compartment here with 10 seconds, okay? So, yeah. Raised it there. So we have this third compartment here. We have flow through here. And this is just the average G through all the compartments. So we're gonna set this, um, and some of this was step stipulated in the description <clears throat> that's in the PowerPoint, but we'll use a width of 15 meters that was set So this was set in the design criteria and it was to combine with an adjacent sedimentation basin. The speed of the paddles relative to the water, we're going to set at 75%. That's very typical. And the temperature is 10 degrees C. So we're designing it for water that has a temperature of 10 degrees C. The average, this is the average GT value is 26.7 times the 45 minute detention time 
times 60 seconds per minute, and that gives us a value of <clears throat> 72,000, roughly 72,000, and that is right between the required values of <clears throat> range of 50 to 100,000. So the next thing we need to do is determine the basin volume. So the volume of our basin is equal to the 25,000 meters cubed per day, 24 hours per day, 60 minutes per hour, and we have a 45 minute detention time. That's what we specified based on <clears throat> the jar test. And that means we need a basin that has a volume of 781 cubic meters. The width, as I mentioned, was set at 15 meters. That was to align with an adjacent sedimentation basin. And a rule of thumb, and you'll see this throughout the designs um, the course, we'll talk about rules of thumb. It's just based on experience. The depth should be between five, uh, between three and five meters. So let's pick a depth to start with of four meters. We have to start somewhere. So in that case, we determined the volume based on our detention time and the flow rate. This is our width and our depth. So we can determine the length and that is 13 meters. Now each basin is 13 meters is the total length. So if we're looking again at our <clears throat> flocculation basin, the total length is 13 meters. We have three compartments. So the length of each compartment is then 4.34 meters. Okay. In order to provide design specifications that can be met, we're going to round off and we'll only use one decimal place. So if our length is 4.3 meters, so we've just rounded off, we could round up or down, but we round it down times three, so it's of 0.9 meters. So instead, when we round off, this is not going to be 13. This is actually going to be 12.9 meters. The volume is 12.9 meters then times 15, the width times the depth. And so it is actually 474 meters cubed. So it's slightly less. So notice we determined the volume, we then calculated the length, we then made a engineering judgment on what was a reasonable, reasonable design specification. So we go from 4.34 meters to 4.3 meters. That gives us a new length, which gives us a new volume just the actual design volume, and then our detention time is still 45 minutes. Okay, so we really haven't changed. We haven't changed the detention time significantly by that change. Now each compartment 
has a volume of 4.3 meters times 4 meters times 15 meters. So the, the actual volume of each compartment, did I, not quite sure what I said, Elizabeth, but yes, the new volume. So this is their new, the, the new volume is equal to four. Uh, sorry, is equal to your sorry is equal to seven hundred and seventy four cubic meters. Thank you. This is seven seventy four. Assuming a depth of four meters, the surface area of each compartment is 64.5 meters squared. <clears throat> so now we need to go actually and size the paddle wheel itself. So we've got a basin depth of four meters. We've got a a design criteria that the depth of the basin needs to be one meter greater than the diameter of the paddle wheel. So at the bottom of our basin, here is the water level, and this is the depth of the water. So we're actually calculating with all of this is <clears throat> the depth of the water. There's actually, if we were to build this, there's actually what we call freeboard. And that's about 0.6 meters. Basically, you want some volume um, of the tank above the water level because you don't want water splashing out onto the deck of your tank. So we have a paddle wheel here. So that's our paddle wheel. We need to have one meter clearance and that's so we need at least 0.5 meters above and we need at least 0.5 meters below so we need that one meter so we can make the diameter three meters okay so this was the four meters depth minus the one meter clearance that we need and that gives us a three meter diameter. The next thing we need to think about is the minimum length of <clears throat> the stage has to be it's the diameter of the paddle wheel plus a design criteria of one meter, meter minimum between the stages. So back looking here, okay, we want one meter, so well, let's go back here. Here is the next paddle wheel and we want one meter between the stages. And so we had a minimum length, then the diameter. So the diameter is three meters. We need a one meter minimum between the stages. So the minimum length is four. We have a length of 4.3 meters. This is the actual length. So we've met that criteria. The design specifications 
stayed that we have four paddle wheels per shaft. And this is given in the specifications. Okay. So the way that I drew this back here, I only have two on the shaft. So this is your center shaft. This is uh, shown with two, but we would have four. So we have four paddle wheels per shaft. The required clearance is twice the minimum clearance. So let's look, we'll draw this. So this is the wall here, and this is our shaft. So we have one, two, three, and four paddle wheels. <clears throat> okay. The minimum clearance from the wall is 0.3 meters. And then it is one meter between each. So the required clearance is 0.3 times 2 plus 1 meter times 3. So we have 3.6 meters. You'll notice when you, you'll need to do a similar design for the design project. You will, I will give you a certain amount of specifications, but you're going to have to make assumptions and it's a, an iterative solution. My advice is set up an Excel spreadsheet because you, you're going to want to change the sizes of your units. You're going to want to change the sizes of your flocculation plates. And it's much easier to do that on an Excel spreadsheet than it is to do it entirely by hand. So we have four, these four paddle wheels per shaft. If we initially assume, so we're going to initially assume that the length is three meters. Okay. That's an in initial assumption. And then we have <clears throat> three meters times four blades plus this clear three point six clearance that gives us fifteen point six meters. But remember the width that we specified was only fifteen meters. So we can't fit this into <clears throat> this fifteen meter width. So we need to specify. A, we need to reduce the size of <clears throat> the length of the blade, so or the length of the paddle wheel, and we can take 15.0 minus 3.6, divide by 4, and the length of each paddle wheel is 2.85 meters. I'm going to leave that at 2.85. Um, these are redwood slats. You can cut a redwood slat to 2.85 meters. Okay. So just to reiterate what we have, we have flow in and this is our profile view. We have a water level here. We have three compartments. We have a paddle wheel in each compartment. 
and the radius of the paddle wheel, sorry, the diameter of the paddle wheel is three meters. Okay, so that's our diameter. The <clears throat> plan view looks like this. Again, we have three compartments. The G value starts at 50 inverse seconds in the first compartment, 20 inverse seconds in the second, and 10 in the third. We have a center shaft in each. And we have four paddle wheels on each, and the length of this paddle wheel is 2.85 meters. Okay, so we've said this is what we've stated. We've got two, <clears throat> four paddle wheels per shaft, and we're going to use, and this is the way I drew it, we will use four blades Per wheel. So this is our, we've got four arms of, each one of these is an arm. We have <clears throat> four arms on each wheel and we have three blades on each arm. So each one of these is a blade. So we have three blades on each arm. Now the rule of thumb is that the total paddle wheel blade area on the shaft should not exceed 25% of the cross-sectional area. So again, this is a rule of thumb. This is not from the 10 state standards. It's simply a rule of thumb based on experience. And the reason is, if the area is too large, then you get excessive rotational flow. And you want it at least 15% to ensure adequate mixing. So the blade area per shaft is the width of the blade, I'll add, okay, times the length we calculated, times we have three paddles per arm, we have four arms per wheel, and we have four wheels per shift. So that's 15.05 square meters. The typical width, I just calculated that, okay, is 10 to 15 centimeters. I've chosen an 11 centimeter blade, and that's what gives me this 15.05, okay? So now I wanna ca calculate this uh, ratio of my cross-sectional area of the blades to the cross-sectional area of <clears throat> my basin, and it's my width times my diameter because I'm looking at, because it's cross flow. So because it's the cross flow, I'm gonna use the width times the diameter. 
and that is equal to 0.25 or 25 percent. So it's right at the maximum. Uh, had I chosen a blade larger than 11 centimeters, or if I had chosen a 12 centimeter blade, I would have had excessive rotational <clears throat> flow. So I would want to reduce it. So basically, like I said, this is an iterative um, process. In reality, if you're doing this, you're going to pick a, maybe you pick 13, figuring it's kind of in the middle. And then you're going to have to make, do these calculations and <clears throat> then make a decision. Do you increase or decrease the <clears throat> size of your blades? So we now have, as I've drawn, okay, we've got these blades. We have what we, <clears throat> we're going to place the blade at the farthest point, okay, based, and then at one third points. So the we think I'm going to start with the outermost. So the outermost, the radius is 1.5. And the center of my blade is at 1.445 meters. Okay. So here's this the shaft. The radius, total radius is 1.5 five meters, my blade is out at the furthest edge. So this distance here is 1.445 meters. Okay. I'm going to put the <clears throat> middle blade at a 1.0 meter. So I'm putting it at the third leading edge and then at one third point. So this is going to be at one minus 0.11 divided by two. So the center is R2. So this is R, sorry, this is R, this is R3. So R2 is 0.945 and this distance here is 0.5. So it's at the 0.5. And the center point then is 0.5 minus 0.11 divided by 2. So, okay. so this gives me R1. So now I have R1 and R2 and R3. Now, if you recall, when we did the same, we used the same equation for rapid max. So what we're looking at is <clears throat> determining the water power required to achieve a G value. And we're just going to look at the first compartment. In reality, you need to look at all three. Okay. <clears throat> at um, 10 degrees, the viscosity is 0 0.00131 Newton seconds per meter squared. So for compartment one, we have 50 inverse seconds multiply by viscosity times the volume of the compartment. Why did I divide by three?
Because that's the total volume. Exactly. So this is our total volume. And this is the number of compartments. So we need a power of 845 watts. The power input per wheel. So this is what I'm supplying to the shaft. It's actually more. Okay, this is the this is the water power. The motor power is greater because of the inefficiency. We have four wheels. So the power input <clears throat> per wheel is 211 watts. The velocity, what I need to determine ultimately is I need to determine the speed at which these blades are turning. Okay. And all of your blades on that center shaft are going to be turning at the same speed because they're on that shaft. The velocity of the paddles relative to the water can be estimated from this equation right here. So this is the velocity of the paddles relative to the water. This K is a constant and the 75% was stated early on where we said that <clears throat> the um, velocity of the water relative to the paddles is 75, 0.75. We have the radius to the center line of the paddles, that's what we calculated. <clears throat> we have D is the diameter to the center line of the paddle. So we can either do it in radius or diameter. And then we have the rotational speed. What we don't know is the rotational speed. This is what we're looking for. So we've determined the radius. What we don't know is n. And I'm going to write this in terms of n. So I'm determining each of those. I, I don't know n, so I'm writing my velocities in terms of n. Table 6-7 gives you design recommendations for a paddle wheel flocculator, and what it tells you is that if the length to width ratio is 5, then you'll use a coefficient of drag of 1. 0.2. If your length to width ratio is around 20, then you use a coefficient of drag of 1.5. And if your length to width ratio is much greater than 20, then you use a coefficient of drag of 1.9. So we're going to use equation 6-9, which gives you the power imparted as a function of the coefficient of drag of the paddle, since our length width ratio is close to 20, we'll use a coefficient of drag of 1.5. Got the cross sectional area, and this is equal to 4 times 0.1 one meters times 2.85 meters. <clears throat> and the reason here is here's our shaft, or our, sorry, our paddle wheel. At each radius, we have four of these blades. So we have four blades. So that's why we're multiplying by four. And VP is the relative velocity of the paddles. So we have the power 
as a function of the coefficient of drag, the cross-sectional area, the density of the water, and the relative velocity of the paddles. So we can write this, okay, since all of our paddles wheels have exactly the same area. So A1 is equal to A2 equals A3. We can factor out A. And we have here a sum of the velocities at each one of, <clears throat> so a 211, that's what we calculated. So that was our power input. To the water per wheel. So we previously calculated that, and that is equal to 1.5 times the density of water at 10 degrees C divided by 2 times 4 times 0.11 meters times 2.85 meters the length times <clears throat> 2.10 cubed plus 4.45 cubed plus 6.681 cubed all times n cubed. Okay, so what I've done here is I've substituted in here back from here. So notice these are our b's here. They were all in terms of n. I've substituted in here and I've just factored out, factored out the n cubed. So I can solve and n is equal to 0 0.082. And that's in inverse seconds. So that's the revolutions per second. So if I substitute in here, well, the revolutions per second are the same because the whole shaft is moving at the same number of revolutions per, per second. And the speed of my blade can then be calculated. So not surprisingly, the, the blade at the outer point, so this blade here and this blade here, and that blade there, and this one right there, all have to move at a faster velocity than the innermost because it's moving a greater distance. And the tip speed should be between, and this is rule of thumb, should be between 1.5 and 1 meter per second. And this is again from table 6-7 in the textbook and we can calculate the maximum rotational speed in RPMs and that is just the 0.082 revolutions per per second we multiply that by 60 seconds per minute that is 4.9 RPMs Typically, you're going to want a variable speed drive. And I'll answer that question in just a second. You're going to want a variable speed drive so that you can adjust your G value based on water quality. So we would pick a variable speed drive that would go from RPMs to 
from 1.25 up to about 5. So the question is, where did the N come from? Go back, way back here. N is the rotational speed. We don't know what the rotational speed is. So what we determined here was that the, we determined the velocity of the paddles relative to the water is a function of this rotational speed. So then when we go to the equation for power, we have velocity in here, but we don't know n. We know the power, but we don't know n. So what we're doing is we substitute in for the velocity as a function of n. It becomes n cubed because velocity terms are cubed. And then we can solve for n. Okay. The minimum variable speed. Okay, so we want a, typically you're going to want a one to four variable speed drive. So that allows you to reduce the g value. So you can, you can adjust the speed once you design your system. So once going back, let's go back way at the beginning. Oh, let's go here. Okay. Once we design the system and we have everything in place, what can we change? Once we've built it, we've got everything installed, what parameters can we change? We've built the system, it's, it's in place, it's operational. I can change the rotational speed, exactly. So about the only thing I can change is the rotational speed. So if I'm changing my rotational speed, I'm changing the G. And remember my G value is, <clears throat> we've got a maximum value so that we don't shear the flock. So if the only thing I can change operationally is the rotational speed, I want a one I want a variable speed drive so that I can adjust the rotational speed. So if I have a one to four variable speed drive, which is typical then you'd have a, that would allow you to change your rotational speed from a 1.25 RPMs up to pick five, five. Okay. So it's the maximum. Does that make sense why we would do that? The last thing is we need to size the motor. And typically, your motor power will be 1 to 5, sorry, 1.5 to 2 times the water power. So what we calculated, that P that we calculated, is the water power. <clears throat> it's not the motor power. So your motor power has to be significantly greater. So let's assume a motor efficiency of 60%, which is reasonable. It's right in that range. So that means that the power imparted, 60% of the power imparted by the motor is imparted to the water. You lose 40%. Some of it on heat, much of it on heat. So your motor power is driving the entire shaft is 845 watts divided by 0 0.6. So this, your motor, power of your motor is roughly 1400 watts. 
So when you're sizing your motor, you're going to have to pick, choose a motor that significantly produces significantly more power than the water power that you need. So for each of the compartments, then we would have different like velocities for the paddles, right? Correct. Yeah. So if you, so for your design project, you'll actually have to go through the same process, but what you'll have to do is you'll have to do it for each compartment. And I will give you the specifications. So I'll give you the results of the jar test. I will get some results for a jar test. I'll give you that. And then you will go through and you'll actually have to size the motor for each compartment and um, size it for a specific um, flow rate that you're, you're producing. So what I'm in the design project, which I think I've, I think I've opened up the second part of the design project, which is the first set of real calculations what you will actually do initially is a population estimate, and then you'll size the rapid mix I think, um, tank. So I will give you the G values, and basically you're gonna go through this. The big thing you need to think about when you're designing is your plan has to operate on day zero, essentially, of your design period, and it also has to operate at 25 year design period. So when you're thinking about designing it, think about, so for instance here, if we went way back at the beginning, I made a decision here, okay, <clears throat> that my design flow was 50,000 cubic meters per day. I could have chosen to, build the system with only two react two <clears throat> um, parallel trains with each having a flow rate of 50,000 cubic meters per day. But I chose three. Is there a, an advantage to what I did versus to designing only two? I have extra for backup, but remember, I don't want, I got to be careful. If I, if I have too much extra, I could put two four and I'd have even more backup, but it's going to cost more. Okay, so two compartments, okay, so I've got two compartments handling 50,000. They could probably handle it, but recognize that this design flow is my design flow at 25 years. That's out. My flow rate, assuming that I have significant population growth, so this is year one, this is year 25. So this is where I have 50K. My flow rate in year one, when I first start up the plant, is going to be significantly less than that 50K. Let's say it's only 30K. <clears throat> if I design basins that are designed for 50K or meters cubed per day, my basins are significantly over designed. And that means that my <clears throat> detention times are going to be significantly longer than that 45 minute, in this case, the 45 minute detention time that I've specified. So by putting in three basins in year one, I can meet the specifications. And then as the community expands in population, I'm still able to meet the demand 
with one unit out of service at the design period. So when you're doing your calculations, one of the things you need to think about is how does the system that you're designing operate both at the plant startup when your population is less and at the design period when you're at the estimated pre or predicted population, so the predicted flow rate. So you'll need to think about that. One of the things that I really try and focus in on the design calculations and the design project is trying to get you to think about these parameters. That it's not just a single solution, it's not just you do the calculations once and you're done. You really need to iterate on a solution and you really need to check, do you meet the design criteria? Do you meet the 10 state standards? Are you within the rules of thumb? If you're not, how far out are you? Can you live with that? And you're going to have to make engineering judgments. And that's probably one of the hardest parts of the design project is that I'm asking you to be an engineer. I'm asking you to make engineering judgment. At least now, there's no impact other than your paper design. In reality, the system works or it doesn't work. Or in the case of Flint, where engineering judgments were made, people are harmed or were harmed. So we want, we want to ensure that that doesn't happen. So we want to think about how do we make these engineering judgments. Dr. Mastin, mm -hmm. can you go over the big picture of the design? So the flow is divided into two basins and then each of those basins is divided uh, as everything below, like into those different compartments with the different G values. Let me get some space. Okay. So here is our flow coming in. We have some, and it may be more, probably we'd have in three treatment trains essentially. So we'd have a rapid max basin. And then we're going to go in here and here. Here's our flocculation basin. We divide it into three compartments. Each compartment is se separated by a baffled wall. And your textbook has some nice pictures of baffled walls to give you a sense of what they look like. But it's a wall with perforations in it that allows flow through it. The first one has the highest G value, so that was the 50, and then the second one is 20, and the third one we set at um, in per seconds. We set at 10. So we're decreasing the G value Y. Why do we decrease the G value? So we don't shear the flocks? Exactly, so we don't shear the flock because as the flock grows, it becomes more essentially unstable. And if we were to use 50, we would start to shear the flock and that would mean it would not settle as well. So here we go into sedimentation basins. We've designed this with a center shaft here. And then on each center shaft, we have four paddle wheels. And I didn't draw this very well. Okay, so we have four paddle wheels. So same thing here, we have four paddle wheels. Um, 
using the side and I keep hitting the scroll bar. Okay. The, the way we design this, the length here was 2.85 and then the diameter here was three meters. Okay. And each one, if we're looking into the reactor, what we would see is the arms of the paddle wheel. So we have four arms the way we've designed this with, with three blades on each wheel. Does that help? Yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you. Okay. These are hard concepts and it's even harder because normally we would go um, to a plant, you'd see these, you could get a sense of it. I have a few pictures. If we go back, um, let me go back to the PowerPoint. These are the paddle wheels at the Lansing Board of Water and Light plant. Uh, this is a different setup in that the shaft actually, you can see the shaft here. This is the first compartment. The shaft actually goes through to the compartments. So it's actually a counter flow. So the water and there's this is the baffled wall here and there's an opening here and the water flows under that baffled wall from one compartment into another so you can like i said you can see the shaft so what that means here is that the rotational speed of each as we move it would go this way so this is compartment one. It flows under here into compartment two. So your, your shaft has to rotate at the same speed. So the way that they adjust the G values here in the next compartment is how. How, how could I adjust my center shaft, I can't make my shaft rotate at a different speed from one compartment to another, like the way I drew it. In this case, what can I change? In order to change G, what is the only thing I can, I can change? I've got another paddle wheel here. So this is compartment two. So this is one, this is compartment two. The only thing I can change are the number of arms and the number of blades. And that's what they do. Okay. So if I had a picture of the next um, compartment, what you would see is there would be fewer blades on each of the arms. And that's how, so they, in order to reduce the G, they reduce the number of blades. This is just another image here. And you can see, this is essentially what I drew and you have your center shaft and you have, in this case, this is drawn with four arms with two blades on each arm.
and this is the same. So you can see here. So we've got four arms and two blades. So this is looking, so the water comes in here. This is the first compartment. It goes under here, okay, into the second compartment, and then it goes under here into the third compartment. So this is compartment one, compartment two, compartment three. Since it's designed this way, I can adjust the rotational speed of each of the paddle wheels. In this case, because of the way it was designed in 1930 something when they built the plant, it's got one axis and, and it's a cross flow system rather than a counter, counter flow, which is Oh, sorry, it's a counter flow, not a cross. Okay. So it's, it's a different type of system than what you see here. It actually is more difficult because you, you can't change the rotational speed. You can only, once you, and then once you fix the blades, you fix the bla number of blades. So our example in the Word doc pretty much looks like the pink image on slide 48. Yeah, it looks like this image, except for the fact that, so we have three compartments. The difference between what the example is we have, the example had three um, blades per arm and the example had four paddles per shaft. But otherwise, it's identical to, to slides 48 and 49 on the, sli on, these, on the slides. So, okay, so here for ex the example we did had four so it has three blades per arm, okay, and has the example and four wheels per shift. It still has four arms per wheel, so that was the same. 